Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenters are Dr. Kadir Halimi and Dr. Rohit Arora. Dr. Halimi attended undergraduate school at University of California, Davis, and completed medical school at Western University of Health Sciences in Pomona, California. He did his residency in emergency medicine at Texas A&M College of Medicine. Dr. Halimi is board certified in emergency medicine and has been working with Washington Hospital since 2004. He is co-medical director of Washington Urgent Care. Dr. Aurora attended medical school at the Delhi University College of Medical Sciences. He completed his residency at the Lincoln Medical and Mental Health Center. He completed his critical care fellowship at Stanford University and his nephrology fellowship at University of Virginia. Dr. Aurora is a board certified intensivist. Our intention here today, uh, me, uh, Dr. Aurora, and the rest of our sepsis team is to bring awareness to you, to the community, uh, regarding this uh, bad disease. And hopefully, by doing so, uh, we can um, help decrease the mortality in our community, and certainly even beyond uh, by, by spreading the message to uh, loved ones. So if you could just imagine for a moment that you've been sick for a little bit, and you can just put yourself, uh, you can close your eyes if you want, and just kind of imagine this being you. You've not been feeling well for about a week or so. You've had some cramps, some flank pain, Maybe you feel like you go under a bathroom a lot, but maybe you think you drink a little bit too much water. Um, does, your, does your urine smell a little different? Is it because of coffee or asparagus you ate? Not really sure, you feel achy. You know, the next day or today, you're feeling worse. Um, you feel like maybe you're having a little bit of fever. You feel bad, you feel dizzy. Um, it's after hours. Do I wait till the morning to go see my doctor? Does he or she have an appointment? Is there an urgent care? Is there an emergency department? What do you do at this point? Finally, uh, not feeling well, you decide to come to the emergency department and get seen, right? It's after hours, you want to see what's going on. You come to the emergency department on arrival, they check your vitals and temperature's high. Your blood pressure normally, sh the, the top number should be at least above 100. Your heart rate is low and your respiratory rate normal being between 18 and 20 is high. So you have some abnormal vital signs there, right? At this very second, your mortality rate is close to 45%. 45, 50%, that's a high number. You're just feeling fine, you had aches and pains. You go from feeling fine to the other end of the spectrum pretty quickly if you are not vigilant in what you do, right? So again, more about awareness than anything else. They do some blood tests and exams on you, as you can see, your white count is 21,000, normal being around 13,000. Uh, your urine shows uh, WCs or white blood cells and bacteria. And we're going to start talking about something called lactate. And you don't necessarily have to know the ins and outs of lactate or the mechanisms, but it's just a, one measure that we have to see what is the response of the body to the infection. And we do that by many different mechanisms and tests, one of them being lactate that we look at. You're given fluids. Uh, you're giving antibiotics, uh, certainly you're going to be admitted to the hospital, probably to the ICU, but certainly to the hospital. If you're transferred to the ICU, you certainly at our hospital, we have an excellent, excellent team of physicians and nurses and ancillary staff, headed by Dr. Akuili, Dr. Aurora, and, uh, and I'll be honest, I've had my dad in this hospital, in this ICU, and it's probably one of the best in the country. And I'm proud. I grew up in Fremont. I went to high school locally, uh, Kennedy High School. I, I'm proud of that. I'm proud to be here with you guys. And, and try to share some of that and give back to the community. Sepsis and infection has been around since the dawn of time, right? You know, Hippocrates in the fourth century talked about the process of decay and decomposition of organic matter. Abyssinia, I talked about blood rot and infectious process. 19th century, 
thereabouts, the term of sepsis was used or, or coined. Pfeiffer coined the term endotoxins. So those are the little pathogens that kind of go roaming around in your, in your bloodstream. Uh, so why sepsis? Why do we talk about it? Why do we care about sepsis, right? Why not talk about heart attack or strokes or things that you hear all the time? Well, it turns out that although it's the tenth leading cause of death, it's the most common cause of death once you're admitted to the hospital, right? So that's pretty significant. How many people get admitted to the hospital annually across the country, across the world? And to think, you know, the, the death rate is so high, up to 45% at certain times. If you think about how many admissions we have, almost close to a million, close to 200,000 deaths, that's a, that's a lot of people dying. And the other thing is uh, the economy. We talk about Trump care and Obamacare and all these things. What about the cost that's associated to you and me and others around the world? Annually, 23 billion or more uh, are spent on, uh, on 1.3 million admissions. Again, these are estimates that are probably a year too old and it's probably higher, higher than that now. So how are we doing with sepsis? You know, we talked about sepsis being around for hundreds of thousands of years. How are we doing? Well, although medicine is advanced, you know, there are certain basic things that we do, early treatments, hydration, all these things that we do, some things have stayed the same. If we look at a graph, you know, just looking at, you know, 1980 to 2001, you know, the mortality, although has decreased, not significantly. I mean, we'll have a slide that Dr. Aurora was kind enough to share with us that shows the mortality rate of heart attacks and comparing that to sepsis. Have we made a dent? What are we doing and how, how much are we progressing? That's some of the questions that, that we'll try to answer. If you look at mortality rates for sepsis and, and you look at age uh, being on, the, on your left side from zero to 85, you can see that there's a spike in the beginning and then there's a spike at the end. And the reason for that is uh, as we age, and of course when you're very young, your immune system is not very well developed uh, and functioning. And as we age, our immune system uh, along with comorbidities, uh, decrease your immune system function. So therefore, at the two extremes, uh, you have increased risk. Now, that's not to say that you don't have risk factor in the middle. In fact, you should always be vigilant. And there's cases every day of young people dying of sepsis. And so sh we should be vigilant. This is the slide that I was talking about earlier uh, that Dr. Aurora was kind enough to share with us. If we look at the smaller bars here, um, that's how much money has been being spent on heart attacks. About a, about a flat graph, right, if you look across. And look at the mortality, the mortality here, right, going down. Now let's compare that to sepsis. This black line that we're talking about, that's how much cost is associated with sepsis. Look how much is going up compared to heart attacks, right? So we're spending a whole lot more money, but then are we making a difference? The big bars? Our mortality for sepsis, are we doing any better? We're actually doing not as good a job as we do with heart attacks, right? So can we do better and can we educate? Can we do things to help with that? And part of that is community awareness. Part of this is lectures like this, talking to your friends and family, talking to your physician or, uh, or medical provider. Know that sepsis can develop quickly. Not only develop quickly, it progresses quickly, right? And, and more than 90% develop in the community as opposed to half of the community not even knowing what the word sepsis means. They've heard of blood poisoning, they've heard of shock, but what's sepsis? What, why, why is sepsis happening and why don't we know about it, even though it's causing such massive amounts of uh, uh, strain on our lives and our, and our resources? Look at, I remember in medical school, uh, and even before medical school, and I was at UC Davis for undergrad, the campaigns for heart attacks and strokes were just kind of being rolled out. If you ask anybody, they know that, you know, heart attacks, call 911. You have chest pain, call 911. Well, what do you call when you think you have sepsis? What are the signs of sepsis? It's not, the easy thing about a heart attack or a stroke is they have defined symptoms. You have chest pain, pressure, weakness, arm pain. You know that, or you've been heard, or you've been told multiple times that that could be a heart attack. Or if you have speech problems, that could be a stroke, and to call 911 right? But have we heard about sepsis? What are signs and symptoms, right? So we should be just as vigilant, if not more vigilant, about signs and symptoms because the symptoms are not defined and specific. Like, for example, if you have this, you have sepsis. So uh, unfortunately, it's somewhat of an elusive diagnosis, but that doesn't mean we can't get a handle on it and we can't, we can't master it. Millions of people die from sepsis. In high cases like John Paul, Brianna uh, Brady da Costa, a 20-year-old model, a Brazilian model, died of sepsis. This little kid, uh, Rory, died at age 12 of sepsis. So a wide gamut, remember we talked about the very young and the very old, but we have people in the middle as well that, that need to be aware and be vigilant as well. 
any process that we're going to talk about today start, starts with an infection, whether that's in your head, whether that's in your chest, whether it's in a wound, in your urine, in your lungs. And then what happens is your body gets infected with these bacteria that's kind of on the slide showing bacteria, and it, and it grows in different tissues depending on the site of the infection, of course. And then your body mounts a response to that. So the question is, who's winning? Is it the bacteria and the infectious source or your immune system, right? Because whatever wins is going to determine how you do. If we are vigilant and we give you antibiotics quickly because the patient came in quickly and gave us all these things, we give antibiotics and fluids, we help our immune system kind of overcome that infection. If we don't, then the other side wins. It's almost a war between two sides if you think about it, right? And, and, and sepsis is a continuum of infection. It's, it's from SIRS, and SIRS, and I don't want you guys to get hung up on the technical terms, but SIRS stands for Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. It starts from there to the other end of the spectrum, which is septic shock, right? So SIRS and sepsis, think about the early stages of infection and response from your immune system to septic shock. Your own immune system is now overwhelmed, is losing the war against the bacteria or the infectious process, right? So that's the continuum you want to think about. We want you guys family members to never reach red. We want you guys always to be here. In fact, we don't even want you guys to be on this graph, to be honest with you. We want you to be home by the pool, drinking a margarita, right? But should that, God forbid, that happen, we want you to be here and come in early and not wait till here. And make sure that you're, I always tell, and I give a lot of these lectures, I give pediatric lectures and stuff, who knows you the best? You know yourself the best. In pediatrics, your parents, I tell parents and moms, you know your kid the best. If a patient comes in the emergency department and the mom says, my child is just not right, I take that very seriously. If somebody comes in and says, my spouse, my husband or my wife is just not right, I take that very seriously because they know them a lot better than I know them. I've only met them for two minutes. They've known them for 40 years. So you know yourself well, pay attention to your signs, come in early and, and let, let us help you take care of some of these problems. So this is a pneumonia we talked about. Remember we talked about infection in the lung. The left side is the black is your lung tissue and that's normal. This is normal, but this white patch here, that's not normal. That's pneumonia, that's infection in your, in your lungs that's causing you to probably become septic if not you go into septic shock. Uh, infection, so redness in the skin, right? We talk about cellulitis. Oh, that's a little red. You know, when I trained in Texas, at Texas A&M, we had a lot of farmers, right? They, they didn't like coming to the hospital, right? They try to take care of themselves the old way, which is fine, but be vigilant. If, if what you're doing is not working, come in so we can see you. So we, we had a lot of people coming in when they had, were on the red end of that spectrum we talked about early. So please come in early and seek treatment and see your physicians or your healthcare provider. So who is at risk for, for sepsis? We talked about that graph, right? Kind of touched us on the video as well. People in the extremes of age, right? The very young, the elderly, the, the immune compromised, right? If you're on chemo radiation, if you haven't had your vaccinations, right? People who've had diabetes and COPD and heart attacks, people with HIV. So th the reason it's good to know this because you may not be on this list, but you may have a friend or a family or a neighbor that is on this list. Let them know about it. Be vigilant. How is, uh, how is uh, my neighbor uh, doing and how is, he different than yesterday and what risk factors does he have? That's very important. I mean, I've had multiple times where neighbors bring in patients and it's very helpful because the neighbor knows the, 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 the patient and they give it, oh well, yeah, he's had a diabetes, he's got a heart attack and here's his doctor. On the other side, sometimes they come in, we have no information and that makes it very challenging for us to take care of them quickly. If you've had a procedure, if you've had a knee procedure, or a hip procedure, if you had your tonsils taken out or if you've had a pacemaker placed in, Anytime there's an invasion of your body by a procedure, you run the risk of introducing pathogens and infections, so be vigilant post-procedure. We wanna just keep harping on the same thing, right? So 60% of cases diagnosed in the emergency department, and the other 40% is after we get admitted to the hospital. Remember we talked about 10th leading cause of hospitalized patients, right? That's a lot of patients, right? In any given time, we have 25% of our beds being used by septic patients. We have a brand new emergency department, ICU pavilion being built across the street. I'd like to see zero patients overall, but I would certainly like to see zero septic patients in that ICU from this community and, and across the country. Of course, readmissions, um, uh, it, it costs a lot of readmissions as well. 
So signs and symptoms, remember we talked about you have a heart attack, you know, you have chest pain. What, you know, signs and symptoms for sepsis is very vague. You know, it could be confusion. It could be chills and fever. You, you may not even know that you're breathing fast, right, because you're used to it. Nods and vomiting. But again, could you have this and have a little flu or you have a little cold and you'd be fine? You were fine 10 times before that and you didn't pay any attention to it? So again, go, come back to the same point. You know your body better than anybody else. Yeah, I've had this before, but this time it's just not getting better on day two or on day three. Maybe it's time for me to seek medical attention because I have these comorbidities, meaning I have diabetes or I have COPD or I've had a heart attack or I'm on chemo. Maybe I should seek treatment sooner and not later, right? Again, knowing your body uh, better than anybody else. And the other thing that really, 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 I can't stress this enough is, luckily your medical provider that you go to in their office know you, have your history, know your meds, when you come to the emergency department, unless you've been there before, we don't know anything about you. And you may be in a state that you're not able to tell us. So have your cards filled out with your list of meds, with your physicians, procedures you have done, or just bring that bag of meds that you have with you so we can go through them, right? Uh, provide, uh, providing an accurate history of, of what you have and what you need, because it helps us plan and, and treat you appropriately. How steps is treated? So what I'm going to do is turn the mic over to Dr. Aurora at this point. Good afternoon, everyone. As Dr. Halimi mentioned, that sepsis is a high mortality. It, has, uh, it starts suddenly, has high mortality, d does not have very defining signs and symptoms. So it is kind of an enigma. And what all we have to do is that put together certain labs, certain the way the patient looks, the way the history looks, and make sure that the patient is not having sepsis. And if they are, then they are patient, uh, patient transfer to ICU. And ICU is a place where, you know, we have nursing staff and physicians trained for taking care of the sepsis because these patients have high mortality and they need, you know, very close monitoring. So how is sepsis treated? So as we said, sepsis is a problem that develops fast. So we need rapid, time-sensitive diagnostic and modalities and early institution of treatment. We need supportive measures which are extensive and which are deployed rapidly. And then there's something called bundles. So we need to institute bundles pretty soon. So bundle, what is a bundle? So bundle is a group of interventions that have shown that when they are done together, actually perform uh, outcomes are better than when they are done individually. When the patient comes in, there are two bundles that we know of, uh, which is, uh, so one is at three hours, three hour bundle, and there is a one bundle at six hours. So three hour bundle is basically, we you know, make sure we give the fluids, appropriate amount of fluids, make sure we, the antibiotics are in by the time three hours are passed, and uh, the blood tests are done and the cultures are done to make sure that we can get what uh, the, the kind of bacteria that's growing in the system sooner rather than later. And the six hour bundle is that once we do all that stuff, we go back and check that the, the, the treatments we are doing are effective. So just to check the, the the blood pressures, just to check the lactate. As Dr. Halimi said, lactate is a chemical that body makes when it's under stress. So if the lactate is high, that means that indicates it's a high stress environment for the body. But when, as the lactate starts to go down, that means it's responding appropriately. The, the, the patient uh, and the is responding to the treatments we are giving. So we like to see the trend, lactate to go down, and that's the trend we're looking forward to. So diagnostic test, what we do is cell count. As, uh, as it's a stressful situation for the body, the cell counts go up, mostly the white cell count, which is the cells which fight infections. Lactic acid goes up. Procalcitonin, it's a marker for infection. That also goes up. Kidney functions. So kidney function is, uh, we need to know kidney functions because if the kidneys are not working at an optimal level while they're coming in, then the sepsis can become worse. So we need to know how the function is, what kind of investigations we need to do for the kidneys, and is it because of the sepsis kidneys are not working, or it's because the kidneys are not working because of diabetes and hypertension, and sepsis is an additional factor to that. So that's why we need to know that. Similarly, liver function, urine test and cardiac function to look at the basic system, how well the system is going to function through that stress. Also, we need to do cultures. We need to do blood cultures. We need to do, if we think that the infection is in the brain, as Dr. Halimi said, then we need to get, maybe we need to get some fluid from the, the spinal cord because that's where the bacteria is growing. So we need to, it's more like a detective work. It's like playing Sherlock Holmes, going where the bug is and trying to figure out what bug is growing. And then 
In addition to that, we need to do imaging, chest x-rays to look for pneumonia, as you saw, uh, abdominal CAT scans. The abdominal x-rays are not very good at figuring out what's going on in the belly. So we need to do a CT scan, which gives us much better, much better uh, diagnostic ability. Head CT scans, again, uh, to look into the, if there is a collection of fluid in the head, then we need to know that there is a collection of fluid. And ultrasounds, heart ultrasound, liver ultrasound, to look at the blood flow, the collection of fluids. So th that's, that's what we need. Now, treatment. Billions and billions of dollars has been spent on sepsis. We have had 157 failed trials of sepsis. There is not one magic drug because it's body's immune response that's uncontrolled. So what we have is all these things can be done separately, but all together they are here to support the patient. So IV fluids, antibiotics for the bugs, oxygen if body requires more oxygen to go through the stress. Mechanical ventilation is when, you know, when the patient is put on a machine to breathe. So that also helps with decreasing the work because breathing is 25% of heart's uh, 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 total output. So as the stress goes up, heart has to do more work for breathing. So what we do is we put them on the machine and so that you know, more blood can be used for other stuff rather than just for breathing. If the kidneys fail, we need hemodialysis and then we need surgical removal of infection. So we'll go over it one by one. So IV fluids, up till 2001, we had no idea how much fluid we were giving. But now since 2001, we have a general idea that we like to give 30 ml per kilogram of the body weight. There are some caveats, there are some studies coming up that it's not that solid number, but 30 ml per kilogram is what Dr. Halimi does when somebody comes in the sepsis. If you have low blood pressure, that's what gets started. And that usually brings up the blood pressure. Penicillin, uh, within three hours we give antibiotics. And penicillin was the first antibiotic which was discovered by Alexander Fleming in 1928, which uh, won him the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1945 and knighthood in 1944. Penicillin saved millions and millions of lives in World War II. So we try to give antibiotics within the first three hours after the cultures are done, three hours antibiotics. This is an old ventilator machine. So these are the lungs, we put a tube over here, and then help ventilate the lungs so that we can take away the work of breathing. Let the machine do the work while the patient recuperates, recovers from the sepsis. This is a dialysis machine, so this is where the filter is. We take blood out, we put a big IV in the neck or in the groin, we take blood out, clean the toxins, clean the antibiotics, and uh, put it back in the system. So if you have complete kidney shutdown and require dialysis, about 33% of patients never recover their kidney functions. So that's why sepsis has a very high cost and uh, we need to treat it sooner rather than later. And then surgery. If you have a collection of pus and there's no blood going through it, the antibiotics don't reach there. So we need to remove that pus collection so that body gets to healing rather than just fighting the infection. So that's why we need surgery at some times. If there is abdominal infection, if there is an abscess in the brain, we need to call surgery to to kind of remove that source of bacteria that, that there is. But again, there are things we don't know about sepsis. What are the exact mechanisms? What are the chemicals working here? We still don't know what exactly, how exactly sepsis works. Is there any one drug that can cure sepsis? No. There have been, I think, two or three drugs that came out and both were withdrawn after a few years because side effects were much more than actual drugs. 157 failed trials, billions of dollars. So best course of action is rapid diagnosis and early intervention. Let's go through some examples. So uh, the first example is 59 year old female came with body ache, chills, low energy, and back pain. She has a history of diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, has a fever on arrival. Blood pressure seems okay, but her respiratory rate is 22, normally about being 12, and she's still you know, having enough oxygen. But Physical exam showed that she had cellulitis. So cellulitis is, uh, and cellulitis was in the back. So in this, the age is a risk factor. Diabetes is a huge risk factor. Especially uncontrolled diabetes is a huge risk factor that decreases your immunity. And with being a diabetic person, any infection can become extensive and that can lead to cellulitis and sepsis. So these are a couple of examples. You see this leg, redness and probably the toe was the cause of the infection. This is a deep-seated infection. What we do is we give antibiotics, but if it doesn't get treated, we might need surgical intervention. The second example is cellulitis of the face. She eventually recovered. 
The second example is a 79-year-old male uh, who was in the uh, nursing home, acute loss of consciousness for about eight hours, and uh, night before was uh, normal. Again, history of diabetes, history of coronary artery disease, history of lung issues, and high blood pressure. And the patient came to the ED, high temperatures, low blood pressure, heart rate was high, rate of breathing was high, and oxygen saturation, which is supposed to be 94 and above, was only 89 on room air. So physical exam, patient was confused, has audible wheezing with visible troubled breathing, and the diagnosis was pneumonia. So this is your anatomy of lungs, and this is the bugs coming into the chamber in the lungs and causing infection, and you know, they, these chambers get full of mucus, and that's what's basically pneumonia. Another example is 30-year-old female comes with fever, sore throat, body aches, and chills for two days. And over here, the risk factor we have is She's young, so that's not a risk factor, but she has a history of breast cancer, which is being treated with chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is something that de decreases your immunity and which predisposes to you having you know, severe infections. So when she came in, she has a temperature of 101. Blood pressure was okay, but heart rate was fast. So physical exam was normal, but she was having pain in her neck. On exam, it was found to have tonsillitis. So these are huge tonsils, you know, and they need to be taken out. 53-year-old male uh, coming with fever and cough, and this is a question. So otherwise healthy, but the coworker had the flu, comes in with temperature, heart rate is high, respiratory is 22, and saturation is 97. Physical exam is normal, except you know when you hear the lungs, you see crackles. So any guesses what he has? So he has pneumonia. But the important things I want to talk to you about is the end result of sepsis. What happens after it? Once you take, once you know you recover from sepsis. Sepsis is a very, very, very stressful situation on the body, and body has lingering effects from that. You are at the risk of permanent organ injury, and if you have a kidney injury, as I said earlier, 30% chance, 30-33% chance that you will end up on hemodialysis for the rest of your life. If you have lung injury, and you have been on the machine, on the, on the ventilator for some time, it, it's possible that we are not able to take you off the ventilator, and you will end up with the tracheostomy, which is a hole in the neck, and through which the ventilator is attached patient becomes very deconditioned. That means if you're laying flat on the bed, every day you lose about 5% of your muscle mass. And if you are in the bed for a week in the ICU, that is a lot of muscle mass that's been lost. And there is something new term coming out, it's called post-ICU syndrome, and we'll discuss it further. Post-intensive care syndrome is, is basically a constellation of symptoms this, that stay after you're, you're, you're done with the critical illness. It involves patients' bodies, thoughts, feelings, and mind. And patients go through sepsis not just by themselves, it's actually a situation that affects the entire family. The whole family is under stress, and similarly, post-ICU care syndrome also affects the families. So the one important thing we talk about is ICU-acquired weakness, and when the patient comes to the ICU and they are getting so many things done to them, we give them pain medicines, to be on the ventilator, we give them sedatives. We get, uh, patients get uh, paralytics sometimes so that they can breathe easy. All these things accumulate and cause weakness in addition to just being deconditioned. 33% of patients on ventilator, 50% of all the patients admitted with sepsis, and 50% of patients who stay in ICU for one week actually get ICU-acquired weakness. And it takes for about a year for some patients to recover fully, to go back to their baseline before they came into the hospital with sepsis. And it makes activity of daily living difficult, including grooming, dressing, feeding, bathing, and walking. In addition to just weakness, patients also experience brain dysfunction. And uh, 30 to 80% of patients admitted with sepsis experience that they have some decline in their brain activity uh, or, or capacity. They might have trouble with remembering, paying attention, <coughs> solving problems, organizing and working on complex tasks. And we don't have an established treatment for that at this point. And at this point, recovery is not uniform for everybody. So we might expect them to go back to their work, you know, previous lifestyle, but it might not be possible. For some people, they can never go back to their previous lifestyle after they come out of sepsis. Other mental health issues patients experience is poor sleep quality, insomnia. Sometimes they can have nightmares, depression, anxiety, symptoms mimicking PTSD. And these all things actually hamper with a post-ICU care because patients need to 
participate in the activities to recover their mental and physical capacity, take their medications. But if they have symptoms like PTSD, if they are not sleeping properly, then this can actually cause resistance and will delay the recovery. And up to 50% of patients may return within the uh, within first year, but some people may not return to their normal life ever after having uh, an episode of sepsis. Sepsis by itself is, is not just an illness for the patient, but it's for the whole family because a member of the family is was who was okay a few days ago is now battling death, is in life and death situation. So it's very natural to feel worried, confused, and very natural to stop paying attention to self. Family has to make some very stressful decisions and we'll explore them further, but this all of this can lead to deterioration of mental health of family, family as a unit. The things families can do for themselves is they can take care of themselves. They can you know, keep on trying and stick to their normal, regular life as much as they can. Hospital has social workers, case managers, pastoral caregivers who can help. And it's very important for caregivers to understand the disease properly so that they, make, they can make informed decisions. And they are very welcome to ask questions, you know, meet the care teams and you know, keep a general, uh, journal so that we can talk in an open environment. And the latest trend right now is ICU also has a team of psychiatrists, psychotherapists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, and speech therapists. And they all focus on their respective facets of care to improve the health of the patient. The, another thing I want to talk about is, is sepsis in geriatric population. Now, geriatrics is something we say more than 75, more than 80 years. And the geriatric population is special because if you have had diabetes, you have, high, have had diabetes for a longer term. If you have uh, the chances of cancer go up as you grow old. And decreased immunity, increased comorbidities. Comorbidities are other diseases you have, like heart disease, like lung disease, kidney disease. As someone grows old, the, the incidence of other diseases go up. Some geriatric patients live in nursing homes. There is usually a decrease in physical activity. If somebody's 20, and Dr. Halimi, I think, can run 10 miles in one go, but I cannot. And most people who are old cannot. And multiple admissions, they have had multiple admissions and multiple antibiotics. So, all these factors reduce their immunity and put them at risk for sepsis. Incidence of admissions is about nine times in people who are older than 75 than patients who are less than 75. So 26.2 cases per 1,000 versus three per 1,000. As the admissions go up because of sepsis in patients who are older, the mortality, the death rate goes up to 50 to 60%. And as we saw the graph earlier, that, the, that it increases at both ends. So at the extreme end of uh, age, it's about 50 to 60 percent. Patients who are elderly, when they get admitted from the sepsis, they die sooner. And if, when they come out of sepsis, they act, they, they're more likely to require skilled nursing or rehabilitative care. Some of the patients I know, they actually want to go home. Their wish is, I want to go home. But unfortunately, if you are at the extreme of age, the chances of you going to a healthcare facility is actually higher than going to home. This subgroup of population is only one-fifth of U.S. population, but two-thirds of patients admitted to the hospital are coming from that special group of people who are more than 75 and above. What plays a role in their outcomes? So more active you are before admission, better the outcome is. More muscle mass you have before admission, better the outcome is. Better your diabetes control, better the outcome is because then you have more immunity. So age and pre-admission functional status, how much can you walk? Do you require any oxygen at, at the baseline? Do you have any heart issues at baseline? Better you are at admission, better the outcome would be. And this subgroup of population is, uh, is a high risk of developing delirium, which is confusion. And when you go home after sepsis, there's a chance that you will have more dysfunctional status, more problems with your function after discharge more problems you have with your functional status, more reliance on caregivers, more medications, more errors. So that is something nobody looks forward to. As Dr. Halimi said, 17 billion in the year 2000 alone, and one third of that is for patients who are more than 75 years of age. So that brings us to something called palliative care. Palliative care is an approach, the branch of medicine, that is focused on the quality of life of patient and the families facing this really stressful situation called sepsis. So definition is an approach that improves the quality of life of patient and the family facing the problems associated with life-threatening illness through the prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification and you know, uh, treatment of pain, 
physical, psychological, spiritual. So palliative care is a branch of medicine that takes care of the entire unit, patient and the family, not only for the medicine, but their psychological, social and spiritual concerns. These concerns are addressed as per, as per palliative care. And the trend is now we are assimilating palliative care in the ICU more and more because as we tend to realize that it, it is uh, all these aspects of care, uh, the, the physical, psychological, and spiritual aspect of care as important as the, the medicines being given, the importance of palliative care actually becomes more and more. So role of palliative care is assess and assist with patients' wishes. This is something we'll explore further. Assist families in critical phase of decision making as medicine can be confusing, medicine can be vague, so, and families need uh, a definite answer. So this is where the palliative care comes in. This is a bridge between the ICU and the family. Assisting ICU physicians in communication, decision making, and deciding with the treatment goals. Palliative care and family and being the bearer of bad news, sometimes if the patient is doing so bad, we have to talk about death at that point. And at that point, patient wishes are paramount. And I want to bring, about, uh, bring on the subject of advanced directives. These are the legal documents which you can make, which will direct the physicians that what kind of care you want when you cannot make a decision for yourself, be it for dementia, be it for being on a machine you cannot speak, and also relieves the stress on the family because family might have a certain uh, disagreement where they want to go with this illness, but if you have defined your wishes clearly, it's very easy for them to make the decision. It's very, it's, it becomes less stressful at that point that what needs to be done, what kind of decisions. These, kind of, these might be difficult decisions for somebody to make. And that kind of helps with the surrogate responsibility. And surrogate responsibility is that what would the patient want at this time? if the patient is sitting right next to us and discussing the same things. It's a very hard job and it's a very stressful job. And that's why we have multiple communications with, with the family. And our preference is that family as a unit should make the decision because these are very tough decisions to make. If there is a family of four and there is a division of two versus two, it's a very stressful situation for the family. But if all the four people are on the same page, it's a much easier decision to make and the stress goes down in the family. I've given you all the bad news. What can we do to stop the sepsis? So, uh, wash your hands. Simple, simple things what we can do. 20 to 30 seconds, wash your hands with soap. Make sure you rub it nicely and you ha use hand sanitizers. Vaccinations. The single most effective thing in the human history that has been done is vaccination to stop spread of disease. We have eradicated diseases completely from countries just by giving kids some vaccinations. So flu vaccinations, every year we should get it. Pneumonia vaccine for at least, at least once you're above 65, and if you have lung issues, every five years you should get pneumonia vaccination. And vaccines have something called the, the herd effect. So if 90% of people are vaccinated, even if the 10% are not, they are protected because diseases don't spread, but 100% vaccination is much, much better. Cover your cough. Always, because the germs go at quite a lot of distance when, you, when we cough. And stay healthy. Take care of yourself, exercise, eat well, control your diabetes, make sure you take the medications for your heart disease and your lung disease. As I said, better you are coming in, better you will be going out. We want you to be healthy when you leave the ICU. And again, I want to thank you, Katie, Dr. Halimi, Dr. Carmen here, and Washington Hospital for providing us this opportunity. The goal of this program is the building awareness of sepsis through education. When the patients come in, we screen all the patients for sepsis. We use evidence-based guidelines for clinical practice and try to save lives through better sepsis care. Thank you very much. If you guys have Thank you. Questions.